Hot quiz, Shot Pop. How did the Titanic sink? Is that your final answer? Well, that answer is... Correct! You're absolutely correct! Yes! They drove into a YouTube Wikipedia iceberg part 2! Now, if you haven't seen the first video in this series that I'm doing, uh, I recommend that you check that out first. However, I do know that you're not gonna do that because no one ever does that. Like, why would you go to another video when you've already invested, what, 28 seconds into this one? And, I mean, what is this, the fucking Stone Age? Give me those fucking endorphins, you know? So, quick recap on how an iceberg usually works. We've got basic shit up here, and down here we've got Herobrine Slenderman shit that'll spook your skeleton to death. And a quick recap on how my iceberg works. Up here we got stuff I was already familiar with and down here we got shit that I basically never heard about before researching for this video. In the first video we explored the first two tiers and in this video we will just be exploring one that is logically the third tier also known as oh I think I heard something about that and that should be everything that you need to know so let's get the video started I think I have the first entry right here somewhere oh here it is look at that Starting off strong with Piss Christ. Piss Christ is a photo taken by American photographer Andres Serrano. Sorry Andres, I probably butchered your name. If it's any consolation, I butcher most names and also most words, so it's not personal. The photo depicts a plastic crucifix submerged in a glass of the photographer's own... Piss. It's Piss Christ. The Piss Christ photo was met with a mixed reception, but it actually won an award in visual arts in 1989, which sparked a lot of controversy because, you know... America? She's not a Christian! They love that guy. People have tried to stop it from being exhibited multiple times over multiple venues, over multiple countries, like for example in Australia in 1997, when a man tried to take it down from the wall to get rid of it, like in the middle of an exhibition, but was stopped by security. However, he was then followed by two teenagers that got in and managed to destroy the piece with a hammer. And listen, I write these scripts in a sort of a Matrix-style sensory deprivation tank where my body lays dormant while my mind works more overtime than a Twitter employee who's just about to forget how Elon's dick tastes when he hears that dreaded knock on his office door, while my thoughts get sucked out chronologically into the order they come to me and gets printed onto this teleprompter that I have in front of me without any real ability to go back a couple of sentences and change anything. And that's a real bummer because I just chat on America for their parasocial relationship with this Jesus fella just a couple of sentences ago, and now I have to tell you about how in Lund, Sweden, 2007, Piss Christ was being exhibitioned when two masked men armed with an axe destroyed large parts of the exhibition. It was called A History of Sex, and Piss Christ was one of the art pieces that was destroyed in the coop. Piss Christ was actually part of a series of photographs featuring various classic statues submerged in various fluids, such as blood, milk, and of course, Urine. When it comes to the intention of the piece, I think I'll end off this entire entry with a quote from the artist themselves. What it symbolizes is the way Christ died. The blood came out of him, but so did the piss and the shit. Maybe if piss Christ upsets you, it's because it gives some sense of what the crucifixion actually was like. I was born and raised a Catholic, and I've been Christian all my life. Erin Burns! Thank you for becoming a patron. Here's a quirky thing I own that I want to show you. It's a Magnus Corridor. It started with a little switch on the side here, and then it makes sounds like this. Thank you for becoming a patron. The whole shebang is a brand of chips, or oh, a bag of crisps in it, if you're from the UK. The bag itself is pretty innocuous, usually being white with an orange logo and black text, but the thing that makes these chips special, and yes, I'm gonna be calling them chips, because that's the closest to the Swedish word, which is chapse. But like I said, the thing that makes these chips special is the fact that they are produced by a company called, I think it's pronounced Kifi? Maybe just Kif? Uh, specifically for their Moon Lodge Potato Chips brand, which is a private label brand whose products are only sold in prison commissary stores. Commissary or commissary? It's co... Commissary? Commissary? Commissary. 
commissary. Okay, commissary store. Now if you don't know, commissary stores in prison is essentially like a corner shop where you can buy basic hygiene articles, snacks, writing instruments and things of that nature. Now inmates usually aren't allowed to carry cash and instead they have an account where they can use money that friends or family give them as well as possible wages that they might make from working within the prison. So this brand of chips has historically only been available inside of prisons, which given the American justice system shouldn't really be a problem since we all know that the point of the prison is to just either have them in there forever, have them killed, or allow them to make friends with other people with a criminal history and therefore help them become repeat offenders if they ever get out so that they can go back into prison and back into their chips. But believe it or not, some people actually do end up leaving American prisons and not coming back. And for these specific people, uh, it apparently became quite a craving to have these specific chips that can only be found on the other side of the bars. Now while I think it'd be a great plot for a Harold and Kumar go to White Castle style comedy, as far as I know, no one's actually went the length of committing a crime just to get back into prison so that they can have the chips again. Instead, sort of a grey market was created where people who knew a guy on the inside would get bags of the whole shebang out of the prison system to sell to former inmates on the outside. For a while, they would apparently regularly turn up on eBay for very high prices. Due to this, people turned to social media where they complained and or begged Keefe to allow these chips to be sold in regular stores. In 2012, Keefe acknowledged the unexpected hit of the whole shebang for the first time, but nothing really changed until 2016 where Keefe did a 180 and started offering these chips in their online stores. I realized just now that I could have just looked up if they actually still are available. I didn't do that, uh, but I'm gonna assume that they are. And if they are, uh, you'll see a price and a picture behind me right now. Uh, and if they're not, there's gonna be a big long text explaining things like I do in most videos, just add long texts that explain things that I didn't put into words. <laughs> Before we move on, I know we're all thinking the same thing. What's the taste of these chips that makes them so special and creates these cravings? And apparently uh, it is usually described as a hybrid between salt and vinegar and barbecue flavored chips. Something that is apparently commonly known as all dressed in Canada. <laughs> all dressed in what? Maple syrup? <laughs> Come on, in fucking Canada, right? Symphorophilia. I added this one to the iceberg because one night during the writing process of this script, me and my girlfriend watched the 1996 Cronenberg movie Crash, in which the Lizard King and Elastigirl from The Incredibles have mad sex to the thought of crashing their car. And I thought that despite not knowing the name for this specific kink, there is no doubt in my mind that it is a real thing, so I looked it up and here we are, soon for Ophelia. So to be a little bit more specific about what it actually is, it's defined as a sexual interest and arousal derived from the stage of managing a disaster or similar occurrence. Furthermore, it says a person with symphorophilia may engage in masturbation using photos of the occurrence as stimulus. Now, full transparency, that definition actually isn't from Wikipedia because the Wikipedia article is uncharacteristically empty, which had me a little bit disappointed, so I had to go to other places to find out. Is it still on my Wikipedia iceberg though? Yes, it is still on the iceberg. I guess you could say that. Daddy, I've been a naughty boy. I've been so naughty, naughty, daddy. And from what I can gather, this is a very rare kink slash fetish and very few recorded cases of people actually having it are out there, but it is indeed a rabbit hole to fall into. And if you do, Please leave a comment telling me more about it because I'm genuinely interested, but for now I need to keep going with the script that I'm currently writing, which is this very video, and I am now moving on to the next entry on the list just after I finish this sentence, and this sentence has been going on for quite a while without any comments or periods or other indications for a break for me when I actually filmed this, so hey Jeff, what's up? Have you remembered to take a breath yet? Stop reading from the teleprompter, straighten out your back, you need to remember your posture. <sighs> Holy fucking shit. Moving on. Salish Sea foot discoveries and the day the clown cried. So if you remember in the first video, I did a thing where I mentioned the Chags, but I only mentioned it in passing and it had a strike through because I intend to do a separate video on it at some point. Well, I'm about to do it again for both of these because I started writing this entry about the Salish Sea foot discoveries, but I quickly realized that that'll be way too long for just a single entry on this list and that I won't be able to do the topic justice within the constraints of just getting this video out on time. So I'll just show them, here they are. 
uh, you know, you can look them up yourself or just wait for my video. I will be talking more about them in the future. And to be sure not to miss that, by the way, please smash... Oh shit, that reminds me. I... Sorry, wait, hold on. Really sorry. I, re I need to do something real quick. Have you had enough? What? I asked if you've had enough. Who is this? The ghost of fucking Christmas past. Who do you think it is? Please, let me go. <laughs> oh yeah? You wanna leave? Yeah? Yes. Are you on the floor right now? Yes. Get up. Okay, I'm standing. See that toilet lid? Yes. Open it. It's open. Now climb inside. Please, no. Please. I said climb inside. I'm not doing it. You want to get out or not? I do. Please, I do. Well, if you want to get out, you're going to climb in that toilet right fucking now. Do it. Fuck, man. Fuck. Fuck, man. Good. Very good. I'm inside. Now flush yourself. What? Flush yourself. Fuck. The Peel P50 is a three-wheeled microcar produced between 1962 and 1965 by Peel Engineering Company. It seats one person, has one door, one headlight, one windshield wiper, three wheels, and it's so adorable. Look at the little baby. Look at him. He's the smallest car. I've never seen a car so small. <clears throat> uh, the Peel P50 was a short-lived car, but it has gained something of a cult following, both due to the previously mentioned small size of it, but also because only about 50 of them were ever produced. During the 2010s, however, a company called Peel Engineering LTD, not the same company, by the way, created a modernized version of it. Uh, this modernized version is mostly identical, but operated very differently. It was electric, it had a top speed of only 16 kilometers an hour, and it could go backwards, which the original couldn't. Oh, but what if you had to back up with the original one? What did you do then, you may ask? And well, let me tell you, you got out of it, and then it had a goddamn handle on it. Look at that, it has a handle on the car, it's so cute! A small handle on the small car! The Most Unwanted Song is a song slash album released in 1997 by Komar and Melamed and Dave Soldiers. Now, it's a little unclear to me, uh, to be honest, if it's a single song or an EP or a whole album, but I'm gonna be talking about it in the way that I listen to it, which is through a YouTube video, and that is 22 minutes long. But I guess that's just a 22 minute song. 
I don't know. The Most Unwanted song was a part of a series of projects by the same creators, all going by the monocle Least Wanted or Most Wanted. What the artists would do is that they would hire a professional polling company to create an opinion poll for the general public, and through the data they collected, they created these projects. So, for the Most Unwanted song, they could draw the conclusions that some of the least popular things that people wanted to hear in songs were cowboy music, bagpipes, accordions, opera, rapping, children's voices, tubas, drum machines, and advertising jingles. So they of course made it a point to include all of those, and that's the point of the art piece. It's the least wanted song. However, you may have noticed that I divided all of these up into two separate columns. And that's just because I want to make a point that people are dumb as hell. Because if you think that any of these can't be included in good songs, or in fact, if you don't think that the addition of these would improve most of, if not all, songs, then you're a stinky little poop head, honestly, and we can't be friends. Sorry not sorry. For these ones, I'm more inclined to agree that they might not be the most enjoyable in in, in, in every song, but that doesn't mean that they're all bad. Opera, for example, there's probably some good opera out there that I just haven't heard. Uh, and take children's voices, for example. I recommend checking out the song Sogård den är by the Swedish band Björns Vänner to hear a great example of it working very well to have a children's choir. So broaden your fucking horizons a little bit, okay? Wake up, sheeple. There's art out there that you're just ready for you to experience if you just open your fucking eyes, okay? You gotta see the matrix. See it. Live it. Burst the bubble. I don't know what I'm doing. Alexander C. This is a Sony XVT33F, also known as a Sony Family Studio. It's kind of like a drawing tablet, uh, but you hook it up to a VCR or a camcorder and you add like analog titles. Thank you for becoming a patron. Robert William Shields was an American minister and high school English teacher. The most notable thing about Robert was the fact that Robert kept a diary. Now, many people keep a diary, there really isn't much uh, noteworthy about it. Uh, however, Robert kept his diary in a slightly different way than most other people. Because when you think of keeping a diary, perhaps you think of a book that you pick up every now and then to clear your head, write down stuff that's happened recently or what you're going through in life currently. Or perhaps you think of it as a book that you write in uh, every single night before going to bed. But for Robert, that wasn't quite enough. No, he felt that his diary needed to be just a little bit more thorough. Now, I couldn't find out exactly why he started doing this or how he landed on this specific number, but the number that he did land on was that he needed to keep a diary for every five minutes of his life. This means that every five minutes, Robert would pick up his diary and write down what has happened since his previous entry five minutes earlier. He actively did this between 1972 and 1997 spending an average of about four hours of each day just writing in his diary, recording things such as his body temperature, blood pressure, medications he was currently on, urination habits, bowel movements, and dreams that he would have. Yes, dreams. I bet you thought about, well, what about the nights? Well, he didn't quite keep it every five minutes, but he did sleep for only two hours at a time so that he could get up and fill out his diary with his sleep quality and any dreams that he had. Like I said, he did this up until 1997, when he had a stroke that stopped him from continuing. For a while, his wife tried to help him write it, but she, quote, lacked the compulsion and energy to do so, and they gave up on continuing it. And that's honestly just so sad to me, uh, the fact that, you know, he's still alive and, you know, mentally uh, there, but he can't physically keep writing his diary, which I have to imagine was like his life work. He's been doing it since 1972 at this point so uh yeah and it's really sweet that his wife tried to help him do it for a while but like of course she can't do that of course her life can't revolve around writing in his diary every five minutes so it makes sense that she couldn't continue it for him but yeah it's just a real bummer to me in the end the diary ended up being about 37.5 million words long and it takes up 91 boxes in the storage facility of the Washington State University, to whom he donated the work in 1999. The donation of all his diaries came with some specific terms though, including that the diary may not be read or subjected to an exact word count until 50 years after his death. Robert passed away in 2007, so in 2057 we have that to look forward to. But don't worry, 
I won't be blue balling you completely. Some excerpts have been made available and I will now be reading to you some of the riveting content from a few of the diaries of Robert William Shields. July 25th, 1993, 7am. I cleaned out the tub and scraped my feet with my fingernails to remove layers of dead skin. 7.05 a.m. Passed a large, firm stool and a pint of urine. Used five sheets of paper. April 18, 1994, 6.30 p.m. I put in the oven two Stauffer's macaroni and cheese at 450. 6.35 p.m. I was at the keyboard of the IBM wheel rider making entries for the diary. 6.50 p.m. I ate the Stauffer's macaroni and cheese and Cornelia ate the other one. Grace decided she didn't want one. 7.30 p.m. We changed the light over the back stoop since the bulb had burned out. April 30th, 1994, 11 p.m. I picked over parts of Newsweek, Time and Harvard magazine and reread them while I ate about a dozen leftover fish sticks. Cold. August 21st, 1994, 2.25 p.m. I checked on whether our county tax payment had been received. It had. August 13th, 1995, 8.45, I shaved twice with the Gillette sensor and shaved my neck behind both ears and crossways of my cheeks too. James Pony. This is an operator minifigure. I usually hate like Funko Pop style things. But this is from the original Marble Hornets creators, and I ordered it online, and I think it's pretty cool. Thank you for becoming a patron. Let's see if I can manage to get through this next one without completely breaking down. Virgin boy eggs is a traditional Chinese dish in which eggs are boiled in the urine of young boys, preferably under the age of 10. This is mostly enjoyed in the specific town of Dongyang. From what I can find, it seems like people aren't sure exactly how this started or why this is done in the way that it is. But honestly, that's preferable to me. Because like, if someone were to try and argue to me all the good reasons as to why they want to boil an egg in the piss of a nine-year-old boy and then eat it, I feel like they're just fighting an impossible battle, you know? But on the other hand, if they were to just say something like, I don't know, man, we've just kind of always done this shit, I'd be more inclined to go, well, okay. I mean, who am I to judge, you know? So as for the unclear origins of this, I'm just gonna read straight up from Wikipedia because I think this part is just fucking great. In general, China has had a long history of food preservation methods. Tea eggs were originally developed to preserve the food for a long time. While the boy eggs may not have necessarily had the same origin, their development comes from a similar cultural background. There is no good explanation for why it must be boy's urine specifically. It has simply been so for centuries. <laughs> the Wikipedia article also has a section just called preparation and obviously I'm gonna read that as well. The dish is prepared by first soaking the eggs in the urine of young boys. I don't know what I was expecting, uh, that's the first sentence. It's just, first you soak the egg in boy piss, <laughs> like, I mean yes, that, that does make sense, I guess. I guess I just thought that there would be some more stuff to it, but no, it's just straight into uh, piss soaking the egg, okay. The urine is sourced locally by each vendor. Oh good, wouldn't want big boy piss to control the market. It's good to hear that homegrown locally sourced products are still viable in the 2020s. The mixture is heated over a stove. After boiling, the eggshells are cracked around the entire surface of the egg. Afterwards, the eggs are placed back into the urine. The used urine is then replaced with fresh urine and the process is repeated. The soaking process allows the eggs to become cured in the urine as they are left to simmer. The entire process is generally a day-long endeavor. Now, this is obviously kind of wild, uh, at least to my ears, but uh, before anyone starts going, Oh, ew, boy piss eggs? What the fuck? I just want to remind everyone that this is like an ancient tradition. It's not like anyone is doing this in this modern day and age. Oh, what? sorry, wait, I'm getting a message from my producer. Hold on. Yeah? Scroll down in the article. Oh. 
Virgin boy eggs are widely accepted as a time-honored tradition of the city, rather than considered taboo as they are most other cultures. Boy egg vendors go to elementary schools in the city where they collect urine from young boys, preferably under the age of 10. The children, having been raised in the city and its culture, are used to the practice. As young boys would in schools from many other cultures, they excuse themselves from class when they feel the urge to urinate. However, instead of going to the restroom, they relieve themselves in the basin that vendors place in the hallways. And that's uh, virgin boy eggs. Fun fact time! A virgin boy egg usually costs about 151, which is approximately 0.24 US dollars, and that is approximately twice the price of a non piss egg. Also, just known as an egg. A normal, just an egg without a child's pee. Lux alpaca. This is what my living room table looks like right now, but hopefully it won't very soon. But right now it does. Thank you for becoming a patron. And that's it for this entire tier. Uh, this video ended up being a bit shorter than the last one, but I decided that I prefer to do something that comes out semi-regularly rather than spend weeks and weeks on one 40 minute to an hour long video. Also, I just love caring for my mental health. I'm just a freak like that and I actually kind of get off on not being so stressed that I lay awake at night because I didn't get more than eight hours of editing in that day. Please don't kink shame me. Just like with the last iceberg video, there's gonna be a few other videos between this one and part three. But I have a couple of fun other video ideas in the pipeline, so please feel free to stick around for those. Now, if you thought this video was funny or interesting at any point, please consider the Patreon linked somewhere on the screen right now. These videos take up pretty much the equivalent of a full-time job, and here's the amount of money I made from YouTube last month, here's the amount of subscribers I currently have, and here's an actual photo of my wallet. So please consider it. Uh, on the screen right now are my patron producers who are above a certain tier. And here are the rest of my patron supporters. Thank you so much to all of you. I really appreciate it. And if you watch this far and you like this video, uh, check out this one where I dip my finger in chili powder and proceed to poke my eyeball with it for 45 minutes straight. See ya.